This is John Barry with Pivot Point Security. Uh, this presentation was originally given in Philadelphia in March of 2011 to a group of uh, CSOs. I think we've got an interesting perspective on this particular issue, that being vendor or partner or even customer risk management, uh, because we've been fortunate enough to work on both sides of the aisle. Uh, we've been on the side where we're providing the assurance, and more recently we're doing a lot of work on the side where we're looking to gain assurance, right, building out a vendor risk management program. Now, clearly there's some good reasons that outsourcing and the use of the cloud are increasing. Um, flexibility, time to market, these types of issues. So there are great benefits. But as we know, nothing comes for free. And with those benefits comes increased risk. And I think outsourcing is, you know, very much risk laden. Uh, you know, you have significant challenges with making sure that people are complying with the laws and regulations that are critical to you. And you've got the concern that the data that's being housed on your behalf is being treated with the security controls and mechanisms necessary uh, to ensure that your risk is mitigated to an acceptable level. Now, the minute, uh, by the way, that's Doug Curling, uh, President of Choice Point, you probably, from his uh, testimony in front of Congress, you probably don't want to be in that position. And the minute that we get risk involved, right, the minute risk is noted, what we end up with is internal audit. We end up with regulators coming in and really beginning to tell us what we need to do to be able to manage that risk. Now, the one key point you always have to understand when you consider risk associated with outsourcing is that you can outsource your call center. You can outsource app dev. You could really even outsource your entire, entire IT operations. But there's one thing you can outsource, right? That's your responsibility. Uh, and that's your liability associated with the data. Now, what's interesting is responsibility. Um, responsibility can be challenging to determine. Um, this is a pretty good example from a recent project. Uh, an entity that we were doing work with had decided they wanted to outsource the development of application to India. Uh, now, the, the application housed and processed some fairly sensitive data with regards to healthcare data and also some credit cards. Now, the dev shop over in India decided that they really needed to colo this application in the United States so that the client could have access to it. Um, and then they also realized that for certain flex periods that they would need a little bit more capacity. So they also outsourced part of this. They leveraged the EC2 cloud from Amazon. They used a separate third party to do the transaction processing. Good practice. Um, of course, the dev shop needed access to the colo, as did the actual client. They used a, a third party uh, to actually monitor and manage the security of the site. And then, well, they ran into some challenges with their rack implementation, so they actually engaged Oracle to be part of the team as well. So the question is, at that point, you know, how do you know that you're secure, you, the entities that you're using? And how do you prove they're compliant? And if you're going to do all this, right, what type of attestation do you really need to ask for? And really, whom do you need to ask for it from? So determining responsibility is challenging in that particular example, but it can even get more challenging. And the reason is because there are infinite outsourcing scenarios. Um, a very interesting one recently is that uh, working with a, a Global 2000, they've outsourced their entire IT operations. And what's happened is that recently the auditors determined that certain AD accounts had been re-enabled. So you end up with this game that we sometimes call, you know, whose ISMS is it anyway? Right? What is the issue? Who actually owns the responsibility? Again, you own the responsibility, but there are other entities that are part of this equation. So as an auditor, I tend to always boil things down to their most basic level, at least to start with. So, you know, the idea of let's look at this from a more granular perspective, you know, hopefully this will give us a little bit more clarity. So if you start there on the left where we say 12 software development, this is the ISO 27002 control set. And we say, okay, well, software development, well, clearly in this particular example I gave at the start of this, you know, that's going to be with the app dev shop, right? We're coloing it out to, excuse me, we're um, outsourcing our app dev to India. You know, I guess the software dev, they'd be responsible for. You know, incident management, well, I, I guess that's probably the IT outsourced operations that we're using, the SOC that we're using. Compliance, well, that's us. Maybe it's them too. Who's responsible for doing policies up there in the top right? It starts to get a little bit confusing. And as we continue around, you can see it starts to get very confusing as to, as an example, who owns access control? Well, technically, I think everyone owns access control. So let's let's circle back for a second. Let's talk about what ISMS is, and, and let's see if we can 
start at the beginning again and work our way forward and see if it makes a little more sense. Right? At the end of the day, an information security management system, uh, you know, it's your obligation with an information security management system to understand your risk and then establish the policies and objectives necessary to manage that risk, right? to establish the right set of controls to manage that risk in a manner which is consistent with achieving your objective, right? Reducing your risk to a level which is deemed accessible. Critical to that, of course, is monitoring and reviewing the ISMS, responding to incidents, and then, of course, continuous improvement. So that way we know that the issues that we encounter, we're going to encounter them once, perhaps twice, but no more than that. So let's go back to what we're talking about. You know, it's always your ISMS, right? And it's going to be a little bit of theirs. And I think when you go back to what we talked about, right, the two key points there are you got to define what you're trying to accomplish, and then you got to monitor to make sure you accomplish it. And the good news is within the ISO 27002 framework is that information is pretty well defined, right? Um, one of the key points that I see a lot of common misconception about is people start looking at that map and they start looking at a coverage and saying, okay, this is theirs, you know, this is somebody else's, this is the Oracle guys, this is the SOC guys, and I guess I get what's left. <clears throat> and it's really important to note, ISMSs are not a zero-sum game. That is that there is going to be overlap between you and your vendors and partners and customers, between pieces that you own, pieces they own, and very likely pieces that both of you own. So as an example, you certainly would want to know that your partners are considering risk when they're designing their control environments. And of course, you need to consider your risk when you're actually outsourcing you know, your ISMS, parts of your ISMS or parts of your IT operations to a third party. You certainly you hope that they're going to have their incident response plan, and that should dovetail with your incident response plan. Those are just a couple of examples. Again, one of the things that I like as, a, as an auditor is going back to using open, trusted guidance, right? And one of the great things is if you use something like ISO 27002, you know, this idea of what you should consider when you're defining is already defined. So if you look at the A62, right, the information with regards to what you really should be trying to accomplish, they give you some pretty good guidance in terms of what you should be doing. You understand your risks, make sure that you actually address that security when you're dealing with your customers, right, or vendors or partners, and then making sure that we actually incorporate those security requirements, right, what our objectives are in those third-party agreements. Here's a good example, right? It used to be, I think, very hard if you look at the left side. I think this would be a traditional outsourced um, services model. And on the right is a newer model that we've used recently. <clears throat> on the left, what we're seeing is that we want to outsource that whole app stack that we talked about a little bit earlier to a third party. And really, this was a true project. We got involved late, and they had literally spent man months developing hundreds of controls, you know, what, what the requirements were for... Uh, system audit policy, what the requirements were for passwords, how often, you know, what the specific standard was for encryption. And they became very, very prescriptive in the guidance that they actually provided. The challenge was it ended up creating hundreds and hundreds of pages of documentation. And when they looked for a third party to actually operate this on their behalf, they really resisted because they knew that they had their way of doing things and trying to do things in this very prescriptive way that they had defined wasn't going to be real easy for them to actually accomplish. Uh, the other challenge with taking that type of an approach is your ongoing maintenance effort is notable, right? Because every time there's a change, let's say DES or triple DES gets broken, well, now it's your obligation to go back and actually redefine those controls. Uh, worse, by definition, if you define 900 controls and there was a 901st you didn't define, it's really your obligation, not theirs. So it's expensive, and really that particular project got stalled and was became a, a you know, a challenge for them. If you look at the project on the right, uh, we took a very different approach. We had the same type of opportunity to find these hundreds of controls. We said, look, let's let them operate their environment the way that they know how to do best. And what we're going to do is we're going to tell them, look, you got to use 27001. There was a large app dev component. So we said, we want you to use OWASP as well to make sure the applications would be secure. And then really what we did is we defined the 15 core risks that we were concerned about. The risks we wanted to make sure that their information, information security management system addressed. And then what we did was we defined the monitoring that would need to take place, both on their part and our part, and the SLAs that we would require to be able to make sure that they were achieving these objectives. Um, rather than being months worth of effort, it was weeks worth of effort. Uh, the vendor loved the idea. Why? Because they had the same types of issues with 
dozens of other clients and the idea that they could move to 27,001 and reuse that attestation, reuse their approach and do it within the way that they wanted to do it, right? So we were defining the what, not the how. They were thrilled by this approach. The other advantage for the city in this particular case is that rather than having to define controls on a go-forward basis, we only need to refine the risks really on a biannual annual basis. Um, so that's a really good example of where you can leverage the ISO standard or an ISO based approach to manage vendor risk. Now key to this right we said you got to define and then you got to monitor right so it's really critical that you validate what you get and again I'll always go back to ISO or another open standard and really what I can do is find that there are is an excellent spot within the ISO 27002 standard the 10.2 section right that really talks about how do we actually control and validate third-party service delivery right uh, so if you take a look here you'll see it addresses monitoring and one of the other key things it addresses is managing changes right because it's very critical once you've certified and accredited something its operation that it isn't changed unless you kind of approve of those changes so this is a little more challenging than the defining part and what I mean by that is that there are a lot of different ways that you can actually uh, validate a design right we can validate the design we can validate compliance with the design or we can test to actually validate that the net net of it is effective right um, the other th questions or challenges are is who's going to do this attestation you know are they going to do it are we going to do it are we going to have a third party that they define or a third party we define do it or are we can have a certification actually body do it and again very very critical is you need to think about service level agreements and I don't mean just what the system availability is going to be I mean what are your specific security requirements and how are we going to put mechanisms in place or uh, non-ambiguous guidance in place to make sure that we can monitor it and validate that it's actually working the way that we intended um, this particular chart gives you an idea specifically not necessarily of the SLAs but of the types of assurances that you could ask for uh, starting at the top vulnerability assessments and working our way down through 27001 certification at the bottom I would say this is a low to high assurance model so if you've got a client that is doing outsourcing on your behalf business process outsourcing or software as a service and the particular risk is low you can probably live with something up at the top of that list. Uh, if you've got a client that you're doing business with, partner that you're doing business with, uh, they're touching data which is highly risky from your perspective, um, then you're probably going to work your way down and be down towards the bottom of this particular document. So let's talk about if you decide to kind of go in this direction, right? What does a high-level process look like? Well, first and foremost, you probably already have some form of vendor risk management program in place. It's probably more in your purchasing department, and it's probably something that's more business-oriented, right? Hey, is the company financially viable? Do they have the appropriate insurance in place? Things of that nature. And my suggestion would be that you integrate InfoSec into that. Um, the second thing is that you need to understand risk. So you really need to conduct some form of risk assessment. Now, I'm not talking about an Octavest or asset-based approach that's quantitative in nature that's going to take man months. But at the end of the day, we really need to understand what is the risk that we are concerned about for each particular vendor or partner that we're going to do business with. And then once we understand those risks, we need to define either those risks or the security requirements associated with those risks, right? The controls that we would expect to be in place to mitigate those risks down to an acceptable level. Now that we understand what acceptability is and we get a sense of what those controls would be, we can begin to say, what am I going to need to monitor on an ongoing basis? What forms of attestation am I going to seek? And what service level agreements do I need to put in place to make sure that I can ensure that that security objective, those security requirements are achieved on a go forward basis. Lastly, one critical thing is make sure that you factor in security incident and incident response. Make sure that they've got it on their side, but make sure you also have it on your side because one of the keys here is going to be to use those security incidents to improve our security posture on a go forward basis. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, keys are define what it is that you need to accomplish monitor to make sure it's accomplished and then by virtue of doing those two things you'll be in a situation of continuous improvement thank you